Good day everybody, my name is Hanno Peil, I'm an internist at Leiden University Medical Center. My name is Esther van Zuren, I'm a dermatologist and a systematic review author, also working in the Leiden University Medical Center, and I have conducted more than 20 systematic reviews over the last years. We are very honored to be invited to present our data. We reviewed studies evaluating the effects of paleolithic nutrition in people with the metabolic syndrome. Now, why did we think that paleolithic food um, is beneficial for these people anyway? To better understand that, I would like to take you back approximately 4 million years ago. Our ancestors lived in East Africa's forest by that time, and their diet comprised primarily carbohydrates, leafy green vegetables, fruits, and uh, nuts. Now, they had a very sophisticated metabolic system to store those carbohydrates. Insulin actually promotes uptake and usage of glucose in metabolic tissues. And then approximately two and a half million years ago, uh, ice ages um, turned the planet into a cold and dry place. Um, this made the forests in East Africa disappear, and our ancestors were forced to move into open grasslands where they started hunting big game and to the waterfront catching fish. Their diet changed enormously. Uh, they started eating protein and unsaturated fatty acids for the first time in their history. Now this dietary composition allowed their brain to grow, but it simultaneously posed a huge problem. The brain uses glucose as its primary fuel, so the relative lack of carbohydrates in their new diet um, threatened the fuel provision of their brain. To overcome that threat, people adapted their physiology their metabolism. They actually grew insulin resistant. Insulin resistance prevents glucose from being taken up by muscle, liver and adipose tissue. Thereby the glucose remains available as fuel for the brain. Humans thrived for millions of years on this particular diet rich in protein and unsaturated fatty acids and relatively poor in carbohydrate. And then agriculture came. We started growing crops, and those crops are all very carbohydrate rich. And now, insulin resistance is a threat because those carbohydrates, those surplus of carbohydrates, is not taken up by muscle or liver or adipose tissue, but it remains in the circulation. So the overload of carbohydrates in the presence of insulin resistance is a threat to um, human uh, health, in fact. And that's the reason why we thought that going back to um, paleolithic nutritional patterns would benefit people who are insulin resistant. And people with a metabolic syndrome are insulin resistant. Now, Hanno has provided you with the background why we conducted this systematic review. I will lead you through the methods and the results. We only included randomized controlled trials. Why? Because we thought it would provide us with the highest quality of evidence. We compared paleo nutrition versus any other diet in patients with at least one of the five components of the metabolic syndrome. So what were our criteria for the paleo nutrition pattern? It should include vegetables, fruit, nuts, fish, meat and eggs. And we also included fruit oils, like for example, coconut oil, palm oil, or olive oil. And what should explicitly be excluded is dairy, grain-based food, legumes, added sugar, nutritional products of industry, including refined fats and refined carbohydrates. We were mainly interested in short-term effects. So we extract, extracted the data from the first outcome assessment time point from each trial. What were our primary outcomes? We looked for all outcomes to changes from baseline. The first outcomes were waist circumference, triglyceride, HDL cholesterol, which is the good cholesterol, 
blood pressure and then both systolic and diastolic and fasting blood sugar. Those are the five components of the metabolic syndrome. Furthermore, we were interested to see if quality of life was affected by the diets. And the third primary outcome was did the diets come with any adverse events. Our secondary outcomes we looked again at changes from baseline were body weight, fasting plasma insulin like growth factor 1, uric acid, C-reactive protein, insulin and total cholesterol. So when we started we did an extensive and comprehensive search in six electronic databases and also four ongoing trial registries and we contacted experts in the field like for example Lauren Cordain. And like we used to do with systematic reviews, two authors independently checked all the references and looked which studies were eligible to include and met the inclusion criteria. Furthermore, we assessed the risk of bias, so we looked at study design, how well the studies were conducted and how well the study was reported. We did the data extraction and then of course we analyzed the data and then we rated the quality of the evidence for each separate outcome with GRADE. And for those of you who are not familiar with GRADE, it is an acronym for grading of recommendation, assessment, development and evaluation. It is a systematic and explicit and also transparent approach of making judgment about the quality of the evidence and the strength of recommendations. Assessment of quality of evidence includes looking at methodological flaws of the individual trials. We also looked at consistency of results across the trials and about the effectiveness of the diets. GRADE is used by the WHO, by Cochrane, NICE and 70 other organizations for guideline making, including the CBO in the Netherlands. I would like to continue now with the results. We were able to include four randomized controlled trials with a total of 137 participants analyzed in the meta-analysis. The Paleolithic diet was broadly similar across the four studies, which meant that none of them included dairy, grain-based food or industry processed foods. The follow-ups of the studies varied from two weeks to six months which had to do with that we looked at the first time point of outcome assessment. So the four studies were, the first one was of Boers, a Dutch group, that compared the Paleolithic diet with the Dutch National Dietary Guideline. The second study was of Johnson and his group, which compared the Paleolithic diet with an International Dietary Guideline for diabetes. The third study of Lindeberg compared Paleolithic nutrition with the Mediterranean-like consensus diet. And the last study was from Melkberg, who compared Paleolithic nutrition with a Scandinavian dietary guideline. So now we are going to look at the result for the primary outcomes. And as you can see in the forest plots, those are the little black, sw um, the black diamonds, you can see that weight circumference as well as triglycerides showed a statistically significant difference in favor of the Paleolithic diet. The same holds true for blood pressure. Both systolic blood pressure as well as diastolic blood pressure showed a statistically significant difference in favor of the Paleolithic diet. And when we look at the last two components of the metabolic syndrome, HDL cholesterol and fasting blood sugar, Although the differences are not statistically significant, it clearly shows a trend in favor of the Paleolithic diet. So now for our other primary outcomes, quality of life was not assessed in any study. And also adverse events were only assessed in the study of Boers, and there we saw that there were no treatment-related adverse events in that study. The secondary outcomes, three of the secondary outcomes there was no difference between the two diets. And for insulin like growth factor 1 and uric acid, those outcomes were not assessed in any of the included studies. However, if we look at body weight, we see that there is a statistically significant difference of minus 2.7 kilo in favor of the Paleolithic diet. 
What was the quality of the evidence of these results of the separate outcomes? Grade rates the quality of the evidence from high to very low. A randomized controlled trial always starts high but can be downgraded for several reasons. And in our systematic review, each outcome was downgraded from high to moderate. Why? Mainly due to imprecision. And it had to do with wide confidence interval and it was mainly caused by the small sample size. So we mostly downgraded for small sample size. The other reason for downgrading was inconsistency in results. What do these results mean? In the first place, a reversion to a Paleolithic nutritional pattern improves metabolic anomalies in people with the metabolic syndrome on the short term. In the second place, they suggest that Paleolithic nutrition can prevent um, chronic disease more or better than um, current gu dietary guidelines in the long term. What do these results not mean? They do not mean that Paleolithic nutrition is good for everyone or is necessary for everyone. The studies concerned only people with the metabolic syndrome. How do these results come about? Why does Paleolithic nutrition have these beneficial effects in insulin resistant people? Well, first of all, we think that the relative lack of carbohydrate is important and the richness in fiber. Um, secondly, the lack of uh, processed uh, sugars is an important issue. Thirdly, low salt, processed food, um, and, and Paleolithic nutrition does not contain processed food. Processed food has a lot of salt, and salt obviously is important for blood pressure. Then there's a beneficial ratio of various fatty acids. There's relatively um, a lot of um, polyunsaturated and monounsaturated fatty acids, and, and the balance between those um, is, is favorable in paleolithic nutrition, dampening inflammatory reactions. And then finally, an important issue is whether the lack of cereals, dairy, or legumes is important. And we actually really don't know. So we think that um, at this time, there is no need to, um, and no uh, intention, there sh should be no intention to adapt clinical guidelines. We think that the, the data and the results of our study should promote and stimulate further research evaluating the effects of paleolithic nutrition in the long term and studying um, the significance of the lack of legumes, uh, cereals and dairy um, for the metabolic benefits. We would like to conclude our presentation with thanking our co-authors. The first one is Eric Mannheimer, who was the lead author of the team. The second one was Sibish Fedorovic, who was the initiator, the inspirator, and also the one who brought the team together. Thank you both.